Welcome to the space where creators have aligned a positive and intellectual collab of open minds. For sharing and learning from one another, it's a vibe. We give us a podcast on the mic. Subscribe, educators, spitting bars. I guess you didn't know I'm multifaceted and humble, taking off life goals. The classroom is my comfort zone where I plant and sow. Seeds of knowledge, compassion, empathy, and hope. Reading is the key to unlocking your potential. Countless benefits, including positive and mental. Regardless of the genre, books are highly influential. Go get yours, I'll get mine. Make you strive. Money mental. Come rock with me and get down to this new jam. Yeah. I my friends, I had a very simple plan. Educate the masses through books and life lessons. It's a grand slam. I'm out. Tala Falava, Bula, and welcome to the Reads of Rosa podcast. I am really excited to introduce today's guest. She is an Indo-Fijian Muslim born in Lautoka, Fiji, and she later immigrated with her family to Canada. She is a self-identified island girl and a YA fiction fantasy author. She writes female-centric books that celebrate life in all its messy and often violent glory. Salam and welcome to the show, Nafiza Azad. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Welcome to the show. I'm so happy you said yes. How are you? I'm I'm good. It's Friday evening and, you know, as an author, I usually spend my Fridays writing. So it's good to actually be talking to someone, someone Whoa. real in my head. Oh, I'm excited. I'm like, wow. We're, okay, no, let's just get on with that. I'm cutting into your creative time right now. But thank you. Thank you so much, Nafisa, for being here. Um, before we begin, I'll, I'll give you an opportunity just to kind of like brief intro. Yeah. Oh, I am terrible at um, introductions, but l- let me just say that my name is Nafisa Azad and I write fantasy, though I am not limited to only writing fantasy. I've, um, I'm currently writing a rom-com, which apparently is historical because it's set in, the ni- in 1998 and it's mm. actually set in Fiji. So trying to make people fall in love when um, without the phone or <laughs> um, the internet is a very difficult proposition I'm finding out, you know. <laughs> oh, I am not mad. I am not mad because <laughs> I, I can read a rom-com. I'm excited. I can be excited about that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, you know, getting to celebrate all the, you know, as I grew up in Fiji, all it, it was such a vibrant time in my life, my formative years. And I remember mm-hmm. going to school and l- living in a village. And I actually grew up on a sugarcane farm. So that's where I set my book. So it's it's been fun. It's fun. So that's my introduction. Yeah. My name is Nafisa Azad and I write books. <laughs> you are awesome, Nafisa. It is such an honor again to have you here. You did, So you mentioned Fiji and mm-hmm. I mean... I guess people like Fiji, Blue Ocean, you know, that are the resorts. But, yeah, memories of those early childhood years. Like, obviously, you know, you mentioned with your book, you know, we're trying not to, the internet's not in your book, right? It's like no, back no. in those days. So, what was it like for you growing up back in those days? It was, it was. <sighs> It was a wonderful time. I mean, as I re- as I write the book, I realized that we were what you would call poor here because we didn't have all those material things. We had this bat, which was basically a slab of wood, and we would we would make up so many games to play. We would we would use it to play golf. We would use it to play t- uh, cricket and then baseball, and sometimes even <laughs> we didn't have uh, um would play badminton with it as well because we didn't have the rackets and it, it made us so happy just that one slab of wood and mm-hmm. i remember books you know books cost a lot in fiji so there was this one um one library in uh, lotoka city and what we needed to do um and we we went to town usually maybe once a week so I had read all the books I could from the children's section and they wouldn't let me take out any books from the adult section because my card was limited. So my dad wasn't around and I knew that if I waited for him to come and sign and get his signature, it would take a long time. So I went outside, I told my librarian, I told the librarian, oh, my dad is waiting outside. I'm just going to go and get him to sign. So I went mm-hmm. outside, I hid in a tree and I, I forged his signature. <laughs> <laughs> that was really, I was a criminal for real. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I, I, um, 
we used to tell stories to each other, which is how I guess my um how I started writing because we there was no T well the T V was there, but they it was those early days and mm. the programs the <laughs> were about um kangaroos, documentaries about kangaroos in Australia. And there's only so much so many of so much of kangaroos I can take, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it was a good time. We didn't have much in terms of uh, material things, but where nature was concerned, we had a lot. We had the freedom and there was it was the safety to go around and run run wild. So it was a great time. So then aside from your, um, I'm not going to call you a criminal, <laughs> but aside from that story in school, is that where you were able to access books? Well, um, there were books from the library and then mm. we we would have uh, um, we would the majority of the books available were, rom were romance novels so mills and boons mm. i don't know if you're f familiar with that the mills and boons and there was dolly fiction so for the longest time i thought that if you fell in love you needed to be in the australian outback <laughs> <laughs> With the kangaroos and the back, yeah, I, I got you, sis. I got you, sis. <laughs> you couldn't fall in love if you weren't in the. <laughs> and you know, as as a Muslim girl in a very like um, it was a very conservative uh, place. So mm. if you talk to a boy in the in like at lunch, your mom would know by dinner, and he should yeah. be like, "Who was that boy?" You were like, "What?" He was asking for you know directions. <laughs> so, <it> was, <laughs> so romance was a genre I um, gravitated to, and perhaps I read too much of it because I was so sick of those books after. I was <laughs> like, there's only so much. Of it. Um, and then um, there was mm. oh, okay. So when you in Fiji, if you come first, second, or third in club, in school at the end, at the end of the year exams, you get um, prizes, book prizes, right? So <laughs> the reason I walked hard in class <laughs> was just so I could come first and get a book so that was the motivation motivation to walk hard and do my homework i love it that's the spirit see you, you know you gotta balance out that life you're living right like exactly. <laughs> you gotta balance it out i love it <laughs> I, I think you've got the best story so far in terms of <laughs> your first like memories of books i love it absolutely mm -hmm. <laughs> so thinking about that then mm -hmm. your family moves to canada it's weird because I, I moved to Canada when I was 17, which was a f just a few months before the uh, 2001 9 11, 9 11 uh, um, ah, which I otherwise I, I probably would never have gone to come if you know, you know, being mm. a being band anyway. But <laughs> it's going to sound weird, but the first thing I remember the, 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 the most vivid memories of moving to Canada is how much I hated jeans because we, I never used to wear jeans in um, Fiji right? and all of a sudden I feel like that was the easiest thing it was cold you wear jeans and and, I, and my mom's like make sure you pull up your um the zipper and I was like mm. right right and those were so uncomfortable I'm like why would people mm. put these on willingly you know um, but the culture shock I became like when I realized that you could take at least 50 books out at a time from like, <laughs> oh my God, it was like, you know, being Aladdin and getting 500 wishes. I read a lot. But at the same time, as I read, I was searching for myself in these mm. books. I noticed a dearth. I mean, I couldn't see myself. So I was forced to um, sort of, F filter out what the uh, what the experiences of the protagonists in the novels I was reading was, and then find um, empathy. I mean, it was, it's easy mm. to empathize, but at the same time, there's when you find someone like yourself in a novel, it's the, the experience is very different because I believe I was in my twenties, late twenties, when I read um, um, G. Willow Wilson's Aleph the Unseen and came mm. across uh, the first hijabi woman. I had seen in a book and I was like, wow, I'm allowed to be in a book as well. And that yes. was how, like, I have a right. And then, but then there were hijabi women too, Muslim women too, but there was never any Islander Muslim, mm. like somebody who had all the intersectional pieces. So um, that mm. was something I wished to do or and something I still wish to do too. Because there are, there's someone who's growing up on a sugarcane farm, someone like me, who's searching for herself in a in a novel. Mm. That's so interesting. And thinking about 
the different layers or intersections of your identity, you know, being Indo-Fijian, Muslim, and now Canadian, in reflection, how have those various layers of your identity or parts of you molded, like how has it molded you into the person that you are today? Hmm, that's a heavy question. Mm. So I believe this reflection, this um, having to navigate identities mm. is is something that is most easily expressed in the books I write. Uh, because my um, I've noticed that most of my main characters, my protagonists undergo some sort of transformations where they mm. too then have to navigate identities. I feel like having so many variants to myself gives me makes me more open minded mm. and it, it makes it lets me um accept and adapt more e easier more easily than I would have um had I not had these identities mm. but it also means that I'm always searching for myself for facets of myself in whatever um media I consume or, or conversations I have so I don't know. I feel like I'm not the only one who, mm. who's going through this, but it makes it easier for me to talk to people and connect with them because I can understand what it's like to, you know, not have a, to have several winding paths leading mm. to the same destination instead of, you know, mm. one road. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, you mentioned you, upon moving to Canada just before uh, what happened in the US, but you're in Canada, but how, how did that filter over to to Canada? Like, what was happening in the US in 2001? Like, how... Because you... I mean, I imagine the Muslim community would have been affected by what was going on. Like, did you... I mean, as a young woman at that time, what are your memories of that? Or what were things that kind of, like, caught your eye and had you thinking, man, this is... You know. To be honest, I did not experience any discrimination at that time mm. because I was not that visibly Muslim. I did I start wearing the hijab, which is another story. Mm. <laughs> but um but I remember being confused by the I still actually am because I, the hue and cry that was being made mm. after the nine eleven incidents was as was not like it's not the first time that such a tragedy had has occurred mm. but the hue and cry made this time was way more than the hue and cry that was being made when people of color were suffering and dying and i remember mm. questioning that i remember asking why is it that their lives matter so much more than the lives of those of people in i don't know um it was i believe it was bosnia at mm. the time or vietnam or some some other place that had suffered a lot a lot of people had died and it just felt it just felt uh unbalanced mm. and i remember questioning that and i remember one of my mentors going uh just listening to me not saying anything but she listened to me and she said that i understand though i don't know if she was able to understand or not, but mm. i i remember that i just remember being confused and then the hatred started but mm. i was at the time i was in i was i was really sheltered so and there were a lot of Muslim people, uh, people of color in the high school I went to. So I did not. And may honestly, to be to be very, very uh, frank, I'm always lost in my head. So even if mm. people were to talk about me or try to treat me badly, I probably wouldn't notice because I, mm. I'm just so much in my own head. <laughs> mm. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know, I uh, I want to talk about Nafisa, the storyteller, Nafisa, the the dreamer. Um, <laughs> You, I read in an interview that you said uh, you were told by many professors that you would not have a future in writing. Uh, but I, in all these interviews, when I was researching you, because, you know, I, I do need to do some mm -hmm. research. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just like, where did you get that? Where did that motivation and determination come from to keep going when people <laughs> are saying that to you? Okay. So I remember how I said that I had another story where I said mm, I touched to that right. So um, I was actually doing my masters in mm. um, children's literature, and uh, the 
the thing that, um, my program allows you to do multiple disciplines mm. so you can write a thesis no, a novel as a thesis and I wanted to do that because you know I had been so scared of you know just articulating the fact that I wanted to be a writer for so long because I felt that I don't know I internalized the fact that nobody liked me I can never see much anyone like me being an author so I remember um, I was taking a class then and uh, the professor who was teaching that, she was supposed to be my thesis supervisor. So she called me over and I had to like, I think I'm still holding a grudge because I had to go, or travel two hours uh, via transit to reach my campus. So oh I went gosh. and she calls me, I had, didn't have a class that day. So she calls me into her office. She sits me across her on the desk. She sits, she's sitting across the desk. I remember this vividly. And she's telling me that she doesn't think that I have it in me to complete my manuscript. And so I should, mm. I should decide not to do it like I decided to do the um academic uh, thesis and I'm sitting there thinking what does she know about me why is she so um confident in my inability to complete something to write something and because she was telling me how when I had uh come into the class that she was that I was taking she was teaching um my my writing was really terrible and she doesn't know that if within the um space of the year that I, she had been teaching me I would have um I would have improved enough to be able to complete the book. And she was afraid that I would never finish my degree had I, um, mm. if I decided to do the uh, thesis novel. Uh, so I'm the kind of person who, when someone tells me I can't do something, I will be like, watch me. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the time, I was quite aware that she was treating me very differently from um, other you know, white, her white students. And I thought, well, if she's going to be, if she's going to treat me differently, I'm going to appear differently. So when I put the hijab on, I was, it was just a manifestation of my otherness. I was going mm. to present myself as the other. So it wasn't for the right reasons. But then when I put it on, I realized, wow, I actually like, you know, being in control of who sees me. But the whole, like, my determination to just prove her wrong was what, was what pushed me forward and motivated me to write that book in and I the, the book was the road of the lost mm. so it took me about four or five months to finish it and I uh, and somebody else uh, was my thesis supervisor at the time and I really owe her a lot because it was under her guidance that I actually knew figured out how to write a book you know mm. the whole technical aspects of it so before that I had I was only writing poetry because I didn't think mm. myself ca uh, capable or disciplined enough to write an entire book. But then once I got one done, I, f I found the pleasure of telling a story from A to B and then, you know, getting the authors, or rather the characters to the end. And so I started writing some mm. books. Um, is writing your calling? And if so, how? when did you decide or discover or realize that is your calling. So I have been writing forever. I started writing poetry when I was before I even started kindergarten. My mom was a teacher; Ooh. she taught me how to read. So the poetry wasn't very good, but it was writing. So I have been. I my mom's my mom tells me stories of how I, you know, stood up at uh, the school um, when I was in kindergarten. I stood up in front of the school and told them the uh, Red Riding Hood story <laughs> in Urdu. At that, I don't even speak Urdu, but I don't mm. know. Um, but as to be honest, I never thought I had a, um, I would have a career as, a, as an author. And that would be the reason I started doing this full time is because nobody else would give me a job. I'm, <laughs> to be very frank, I applied after I graduated from university, um, math, uh, my master's, it was a very practical degree children's uh, literature. Um, I have a master's <laughs> in children's literature, very practical degree. <laughs> But I applied to all sorts of places, 100 or 200 places, and um, none of them gave me a call back and, or even did to my, um, that, that I had uh, applied to my application. And so I was doing nothing else. So I was like, you know, the night before the, um, um, there was a Twitter pitch on, <laughs> there was a pitch, a um, book pitch on Twitter contest. So I was like, you know, what could it hurt? Let me just try it. So I pitched and then my current agent, she liked that pitch and I sent her, you know, pages and she was like, yes, I will um, 
I will, um, what do you call it? I will be your agent. And mm. there you go. And then that book didn't sell. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, oh my God, what is, what is my life? I finally have an agent. I sent her the book and now it won't sell. And then so um, I wrote another book and that one did sell. So. Man, I mean, how difficult was it to find an agent? Like, is it a whole process or is it through friends? How did you go about that? Okay, so um, the I started there's a query letter that you write mm. and then, which is all authors hate query letters because you know that whole period of uncertainty so you write a query mm. letter and then you send it to all agents you're interested in that's what i did oh. sometimes if you're lucky they will respond with a rejection if you want to be an author you have to know that you will have rejections constantly you have to get a thick skin because if mm. you if you fall apart at rejection this is not the right industry for you so i sent it to a lot but I wasn't very um, professional about it. I just, you know, I was like, okay, let me try it because what could it hurt? So when I um, took participated in the pitch picture contest on Twitter, it was run by Beth Fallon, and um, it, I, it was just like a fluke. I was like, you know, it's good if it works. If it doesn't, it's okay. And then what they do is they will like it, and if they like it, you send them a letter, a queer letter, and like mm -hmm. five pages of your book. And so I did. The thing is, because my book was a um, thesis, I had to get representation or it would be published on the um, university um, thesis. Uh. So I needed to get a deferral, right? <laughs> so, and mm -hmm. the, they wouldn't give me a deferral if I didn't have an agent. So my agent was good enough that she read the book over the weekend and we uh, finalized our, the, the fact that she would be representing me. On Monday, I was like, yes. And then I said, <laughs> Because I was like, yes, you can't, you can't publish it because, you know, I'm trying to get it published. I want to get a publisher to publish it. So, yeah. And then it didn't sell. I was like. <laughs> Man, that is so, oh, it's you're such a vibe. <laughs> so dramatic, I swear. Um, you know, you've already uh, spoken about, you know, not seeing yourself mm -hmm. in books. Uh, and, and at this interview, you say, um, you talk about that and you say, I want to change that for other young adults like me mm -hmm. who are searching. For, this is the part I like, who are searching for reflections, not just of their faces and persons, but of their lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that. I was mm -hmm. just like, that's. A, such a different way to look at it I mean I that really spoke to me as mm -hmm. I was researching and, and trying to find out more about you know who you are as a writer as a person mm -hmm. yeah I really like that um you know writing space what does your writing space look like okay I'm always jealous of writers who can write in coffee shops because I had this <laughs> my mind like i would you know be all glamorous and you know go to a coffee shop take on the computer and just you know type away and then i did i did try it and then i spent the entire hour looking at other people <laughs> but it's, you can call that research you were researching right you were just pondering making and <laughs> making up stories of uh, what other people like where they come from what they're doing what they're doing, you know <laughs> but my writing space i actually write in my room and i need silence because mm. if if I can listen to some music, but it needs to be in the background. But if there are people talking, I will listen to those people instead of listening to the voices in my head. So, um, I actually usually write, write by hand. If right. It depends if I'm writing um, fantasy. I need to write by hand. Mm. So I'll handwrite. Let me show you my... This is, um, this is my book. Oh. I've handwritten all of these. That's your, oh, my goodness. That's so neat. I Nafisa, uh, what the? I have a superpower. I can have straight lines, even un unlined. Amazing. <laughs> but the good thing about writing I've, um, by hand is that you avoid the screen, so your eyes are mm. less uh, painful. But also, you can't stop to edit because you know there's like you can't just delete it. So you have to mm. carry it forward. One of the things that was the hardest for me was you. I would write a chapter and then I would read the chapter and I'd be convinced that it's terrible. Because yeah. one of the things you learn when you write um, 
every day I would write as a, for a profession is that your first drafts are going to suck. Your first drafts are the kind you burn after what nobody can see. <laughs> so a lot of people think that, you know, you write the first draft and it's going to be amazing. No, you mm. like Road of the Lost went through 13 drafts before you, you before it became a book. And all wow. of them, yeah, it's, it be, authors are very, very harsh on themselves. I feel like mm. we tend to compare ourselves and our writing to each other. And everyone has a different style and it's not something like, it's not good, but we do it anyway. And we know it's not good, but we can't stop doing it. <laughs> it's like you have a pimple and you keep on popping it, you know? You're not- <laughs> oh, but, um, so the question was where like my writing space, um, I need things to be colorful and mm. vibrant. And did that, so I don't know. Are we going to talk about the writing process? Because yep. I'm, yeah, yeah. Uh, please, um, go ahead. You, uh, you're doing great, by the way. Okay. Carry on. So, um, I need to be. I need to write when I'm comfortable. And you know, when you go to a coffee shop, you're dressed in your outside clothes, and you can't actually go out in your PJs. <laughs> <laughs> can't go out in your onesie now, Anna. No. <laughs> So, and then you have to wear a hijab and then you have to make sure your hijab is tied on properly. So um, I tend to write usually in my room and then I tell people, uh, look, now I live with my brother and his two kids and, mm-hmm. you know, I have like seven people in my family. That's mm-hmm. a lot. And two, the, the two kids are very noisy. So I bought myself um, <laughs> um, headphones. Noise like, cancelling <laughs> headphones. <laughs> because they scream. One of my, my nephew has a very piercing scream and I was like, if, if you do not stop screaming, Either you will die or I will die. <laughs> For our sake, you know, so that I don't continue my criminal behavior. I'm not. <laughs> they have no idea of your history, huh? I know. No idea. <laughs> so I bought oh. that. So, yeah, I usually write in my ro- room on my bed or on the or at my desk. So, man. So I, I do have a question. Just going back to your beautiful writing and notebook. So that's writing and then do you eventually uh get that onto a computer yes. like yes. you okay. know it's that's a whole nother process right like yes but the good thing is that I can but before by the time I get a full manuscript because mm. I will transcribe it onto um, Scrivener and as I'm transcribing I'm editing and then ah. I will get the chapter off onto Word, which will be the final manuscript. And okay. then I transcribe, and then I edit again. So it goes through three revisions by the time mm. I'm done. So which works okay. fine. Okay, that yeah. makes sense. And and what do you do when you get writer's block? I mean, is writer's block a thing, or is it not? No, is it's, it a thing? When I romanticized writing, then I had writer's block because I mm. thought, you no. Know, if you you had to listen to the muse before you carried on and then when you when you start having um contracts or like your deadlines you don't have time for the muse yeah. you are your own muse if you don't want to return that advance you will write <laughs> <laughs> you like you will do this now hurry yeah. up <laughs> no. and i think it's it's the whole thing that comes um you learn to forgive yourself for the bad writing because you know that it's not it's not the final writing mm. so when there's like I haven't yet come across a time when um I had no words, so I just push myself forward and write, even though I know the words are not as good as they can be, because eventually I will go back and rewrite them, and then maybe um the muse or whatever it is will come back. But I feel like I was telling a friend this to, to that you have to remember that this the world you have created is yours. You can break it, but you can also fix it. So. I like that. Yeah, so um, writer's block is a thing, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a thing. You mm. you, you look at the well, blank page and you you know you challenge it. <laughs> what will you do? I will, I will. And then you sometimes I just draw a line and see like, see that's I drew a line. I have you are marred now, and I'm going to put <laughs> right holes in it. <laughs> <laughs> Man, um, how do you select the names of your characters? You know, um, we're we're going to get into your work, but I I, I need to know. (laughs) I don't know if you've read um the candle and the flame. No, not yet. Candle and the flame. All the I had a lot of fun with the names because um, if you um you can tell a story, 
mm. by um with the names and you know i always thought you know it was such a white thing to say for shakespeare like what's in a name there's a lot in a name thank you very much yes. you, know, you, you might not think it but oh my goodness <laughs> i can carry my whole heritage in my name you know mm. so exactly. um, for the for the kettle and the flame, all the uh, the members of the royal family, all their names mean some has to do some have to do something with the sun, the rising sun mm. or the dawn or dusk. So I have fun with that. And then Fatima Fatima Ghazala, who's the um, main character, Fatima was the name of the prophet's daughter, and Ghazala is like uh, it, it showed her freedom. Ghazala is in Gazelle, gazelle. Mm. and Zulfikar was the name of a sword. And for the wild ones, oh, I had a lot of fun with that one too. <laughs> because mm-hmm. Pehili means um, a, a riddle. So that was that was entirely like her, her character. I wanted to be sort of elusive that mm. you wouldn't be able to pin down. You you would think that she's a certain way, but then she'd surprise you and show another facet of herself. So I wanted to do that. And then all the other characters, their um, histories, their um, backgrounds are in their names. So... Talay is from Fiji, so her name has meaning in Fiji. And mm. actually, at the beginning, there were 20 wild ones, and my editor was like, Nafisa, sit down. <laughs> 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 you know, as many characters. And then, um, but yeah, it was it was a lot of fun to um, just choose their names and then go and mm. see what plant in the culture they came from, what weight the, those names help. And um, yeah, that, I, I find choosing names a lot of fun. Mm. I, yes. I, sorry, go ahead. No, it sounds like uh, just listening to you talk about it, I'm like, okay, Nafisa is having way too much fun here. She should not be having this much fun. But it's, <laughs> I mean, it's uh, I could just hear the joy in your voice. And something that you said right before uh, you, you gave the answer was, you know, you carry your heritage in your name. So may I ask what your name means? Oh, sure. My name, Nafisa, means precious and Azad means mm. freedom. So... Uh, precious freedom and um my azad is my dad's name and um it's it's arabic mm-hmm. so there you go that's like i mean if i were um if i were a- a- arabian I, it would be like bint um azad and then mm. one more. But yeah it, it shows like what i am who i am <laughs> it's important I, and you know that's the like as a teacher like students names uh, that's you know that's why i said at the beginning names are so important to me like how you say it or what uh you know what students or how they would like to be referred to exactly. super important because like you said you know we carry our families our ancestral roots our heritage exactly exactly with our names and yes. some people don't understand that like you were you know mentioning people making fun of your name and it's like no okay get better jokes that's not funny you know like right. what is that who does that you know right right like for example in my first book the a candle in the flame fatima Ghazala, she's in the beginning she's known as fatima until mm. she goes uh through a transformation and then at that point i made uh at uh, i made sure to say to have her explicitly say please call me Fatima Ghazala, not just Fatima, because I am more mm. than just Fatima. So, um, like for trans characters, it's so important that you call them by their the name they wish to be referred to, right? Mm. And you can't call them by their dead name. So I, I feel like if you make fun of someone's name, you're just a very lousy person. Yes. <laughs> that's, yes. That's, it's not something to joke about. Absolutely. Totally agree, 100%. Mm-hmm. So um, just... Um, you know, moving into your published works. Uh, and while we're talking about The Candle and the Flame, um, you know, it was nominated for an award. Like when you're, you know, as your debut novel and you get that recognition, what is, I mean, how does that make you feel, you know, thinking about all the the communities and the people that you represent and the voices that you're trying to amplify? Yeah. It was grand because, you know, like... <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> when you, uh, one of the things that I had always struggled with was the view, the Western view of a Muslim woman as someone mm. who's oppressed and needed to be saved. And I always wanted to fight against that. And the candle and the flame in particular was about a Muslim woman who, you know, defied. I remember um, talking to the publisher or to my editor when she was talking about talking to me about covers and I told her I do not want the girl on the cover to be looking down 
mm. or you know looking away i want her to be staring defiantly at the um reader and just you know ch- challenging you know um try me <laughs> is the islander in me coming out again mm. um, but it was it was a, a being nominated for the award came at a time when um the, the publisher had told me that they didn't want any of my subsequent books my uh after uh, the kill and the flame so i was thinking oh my god this my career is over so um when i got the email that said that it was uh, nominated for such a big award i was like what really mm-hmm. and even though it didn't go end up winning i just mm-hmm. i got to go up there on the stage and like say a speech and talk about what the book meant not just to me but to the many other muslim girls out there who are you know looking for some something of themselves in the books they read and mm-hmm. thank goodness there, there are a lot more books authored by muslim uh authors now but at that time there weren't very many and i i had talked to uh, girls and they had told me that it's difficult because all the books they read have girls having boyfriends and that was and uh, being mm. they couldn't uh, um that was something they couldn't uh, empathize or connect with so it was it was great it it just felt like i was being seen and you know it's it's so empowering that feeling of being seen of being heard is so empowering so yeah mm. that was a great that was a great experience and I'm what glad. was the response from your loved ones your family your friends uh, the communities that you're part of you know what was the response to your debut novel um my mom is always on my side mm. Uh, so my family my family is always aware that i because i'm always in my room so they're like she's doing something in there so mm-hmm. when i actually came out with a book they were like oh so that's what you have been doing, doing- <laughs> <laughs> all those times you just miss out on you know family gatherings and whatnot that you've actually been doing something and not just avoiding us <laughs> so mm-hmm. there was like a bit of that too but honestly i was just writing <laughs> mm-hmm. but it was they were happy for me and it was it, it was great it was like because I, the Fiji, um, the Fijian population in um, in in Canada where I live, is is not it's not huge, but there are still people. Mm. And but I'm I'm very introverted, so I don't go out and meet them. Mm. So I don't know like if they're even aware that I have written a book. <laughs> but um, the librarians I met and the young people I met who had read my books, they were they were amazing because the whole um recognition of yourself in the words of a in a of a book they mm. felt that and i felt i'm um, vindicated <laughs> and yeah it was it was good that's so cool when you meet readers or hear from readers mm-hmm. i mean that must be like the best feeling like knowing that oh people do care about what I'm putting out into the literary world, right? Like I am making a, I am making a, a, a footprint in this, in this world. And you know what? It, it's resonating. It's mm-hmm. speaking to someone mm-hmm. out there. Oh, how cool. <laughs> Man. Uh, so you finish, you know, you, you write that first debut novel. I mean, obviously you've been writing for a very long time, like you mentioned, even from a young age, but then, how do you get up again and say right onto the next book? You know how? Do, what is there a whole process you go through where you're like, okay, I'm taking a few months off. I'm I'm not doing anything, or do you just continue to write okay. stories? Okay, so one of the things I deal with or struggle with is anxiety, and the best way mm. for me to curb my anxiety is to write to throw myself into another wall ah. because if I'm if I'm listening to different voices in my head, I don't have to listen to my own. Mm. But I started writing The Wild Ones, I feel like uh, two, three months after I had handed in um, um, The Cow and the Flame. I thought it would be easy because I had already written a book and I know what is how to do it now. And this was going to be my third book. I was so very wrong. Especially, mm. I mean, you've read The Wild Ones and it, mm. it was not an easy book to write. In fact, it was. it has probably been the hardest book I have written thus far. Not mm. just because, um, well, mostly because I had to um, excavate bits of myself. That book was very personal to me. It was, 
it was it was me trying to deal with what I had been through and then it was me trying to deal with the anger in such a way that didn't feel like that didn't feel gratuitous mm. that that conveyed my anger but yet you know hope I wanted it to be a hopeful book despite everything that happens in it and that's why there were some decisions I made and that's why I was um that's why I took it it has the format it does because when some pains are too big you don't approach them um as a whole you break it apart that's why you will mm. find that um the wild ones has short chapters and then mm. breaks and then um different uh, P- povs mm. but yeah mm. you say uh this the uh, sorry i'm i'm so like i'm i'm really yeah i'm i'm really kind of getting moved i'm moved by what you're sharing I'm not daydreaming. I really am. I'm just kind of like it's kind of hitting me like this is deep. Um so for everyone uh, that's listening or um if you're watching the I I you know I, I know my lighting's not too good, but this is the book that Nafisa is talking about right now. Um you say it's an explicit call to arms and also an invitation to a sisterhood, mm-hmm. a sisterhood that's often denied and denigrated. Mm-hmm. Can you uh, st- uh, d- speak on that? And Okay, so um, women of color go through a lot more than any other, <laughs> than white women. And just if you see, like, in Canada, there's... Uh, the um, Native women go missing or end up dead, you know, mm-hmm. frequently. But people don't seem to, like, the authorities don't take it seriously. Mm-hmm. Look at um, um, the the guy who killed so many Native women it, uh, um, and the, the pig farm. And it took them so long to mm-hmm. find them. And there are countless other stories over there. Everything that happens in the wild ones, they're all, like, they're all collected from um, um, news and media, like the, the the body you found in a trashed can, or you know, like the the horrendous things happening in India. And yet, women are often pitted against each other. Like mm-hmm. you're supposed to be jealous, you're supposed to envy, and you can't like even in stories, even like in YA novels I was reading, the best friend was a foil for her, for the protagonist, for the female protagonist, just to show how I you know pure or, you know, um, more attractive she was. There's this, this friendship, this sisterhood, this, you know, um, this whole, it's almost tangible. Like when you want, to, when you um, have a friendship between women that is strong and perhaps stronger than the romantic relationships. It seems that the world and society is afraid of those kinds of relationships. Anything that uh, um, will shake the shake the status quo, because mm. when women put each other first and the friendship first, that threatens the heteronormative society, right? So I wanted I wanted there to be it, the friendships would be platonic, but just because they're platonic don't make them any less than mm. uh, romantic relationships. And I wanted to put that forward. And I wanted women to be um, they're each other's, uh, what do you call it, cheerleaders. Mm. Um, they would, be, they would um, empower each other, not bring each other down. Not, they wouldn't be compared to each other. And that was, that was my intention. That was why I used we as a perspective mm. in the book. As for an explicit call to arms, I feel like we've we've been very very like subtle about feminism, being implicit in your in the writing, you know. And I was mm-hmm. like, it's, it's time. Like, if the French can have urinals shaped like female lips, it's mm-hmm. time to stop, to, you know, beating around the bush and then just st- um call it out, you know, call mm-hmm. out the misogyny for what it is. It's not art. It's misogyny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Fam, if you are watching, listening, um, nafizaazad.com, <laughs> check out, check the bio. You know what I do? Check the YouTube bio, check it on Spotify, Google Podcasts. The website will be there. How you can connect um, with this amazing sister right here. I mean, seriously, if you're not following her on Bookstagram, what are you doing? 
That's all I'm saying. But I want to uh, bring up the book again and say that when I saw this in our school library, I, I really was like taken aback because first of all, I was like, wait a minute. That character, why does that character on the book cover have a flower uh, in her hair? You know, I was just kind of like, what? You know, I was like, what is this? But something I have noticed is your book covers are amazing. Nafisa, tell us who you're working with and how, what is your part in terms of what ends up on the cover? Like your... I yeah. have very little to do with it, to be honest. I've been very lucky. I've been superbly lucky because mm. when they sent me um, the cover for uh, The Candle on the Flame, I was like, what? For me? And mm. that was amazing. And for um, the uh, uh, the Wild Ones, that was also amazing. And then I had The Road of Lost, which was, mm. you know, it, I was like three, four, three. I'm, it's, it's good. And then um, my... Uh, anthology that's coming out writing in mm. color which i'm super excited for mm. it also has a great cover so i don't know i don't work with anyone in particular and i have very ah, okay this is all the marketing mm. but i've been very lucky so far yeah i i've that's what caught my eye the flowers mm. and especially because i was just like <gasps> Is she an islander author yeah. like that yeah. was my friend i was like oh my god is she an islander then i start researching uh, not stalking everyone researching and then i find your website and then i find your bookstagram online i start following and i'm like wow here's a voice that needs to be heard let's put her on blast so um man amazing you know when i look up the road of the lost or when anyone looks it up on google many websites say it's the perfect read for fans of Holly Black's The Cruel Prince. I love The Cruel Prince. I've read it. But I, I want to know, what are your thoughts on this? Like, um, I love The Cruel Prince too. Yeah. I, I found I found Jude's, um, you know, mm. she was such a character. And then when she started getting all feisty, mm -hmm. I love that. Right. But, but the only thing that's common with um, mm. the, the Road of the Lost and The Cruel Prince is that they <laughs> both have um, um, what do you call Faye? They're all they're yeah. both talking about Faye. The Road right. of the Lost. The Road of the Lost is very very different. It's yes. So please tell us so that everyone that is looking this up understands. Okay. So um, if you were born in Fiji or you know mm. if you were from that side of the world or in England, chances are as you grew up, you read Annie Blyton. I'm not sure. Do you do you know who uh, fab, uh, um, the, fabul no. the fabulous five? five, fab the, famous yeah. five the famous five. Okay, famous she's five. super problematic, and I only right. realized it as an adult. But mm -hmm. at that time, when I, her books were foisted, well, there, there seemed to be the only things that were available in school libraries. You know, famous mm. five, naughty, whatnot, right? And then there was the the wishing chair and the and the enchanted forest, whatnot. So this is my response to all the books all the any button books i have read it's mm. about the road of the lost is about this girl you meet her when she's she has turned 17 when you meet her she's a brownie of a diminutive mythical creature mm. who is supposed to be very domesticated she cleans houses and whatnot my character does not like doing housework at all and <laughs> she is probably one of my favorite characters because she embodies the vulnerability of what of adolescence mm. holy more holy than any of my other characters have and when uh, w one day she wakes up and her bones start growing and that's there's incredible pain she starts mm. changing but nobody will tell her what is happening to her who she doesn't know what shape she is she doesn't know what her real identity is so she has to travel from the human world into the other world the fair world and this is the road of the lost mm. and along the way she meets different kinds of fair creatures some of them who try to try to eat her and others give her you know errands to do mm. and then she meets a fair prince in her dreams and often in these dreams she is a different shape once she meets him as a tree and she's like we'll never talk about this again and then she meets him as a lizard and she's like you know i meet a cute guy and i have a tail <laughs> i can't wait
wait to read it. I'm waiting for it to come through on my Libby app, but I'm just like, I'm so and, curious now. <laughs> and then she finds, like, she gets power, but at the same time, there's a cost to that power. And she is betrayed. There's this one line in the book that um, that I really love. It's, it, it is, um, what's the point of, I'm paraphrasing, what's the point of calling you father? A father is just another way I have been betrayed. So there's a lot of mm. angst in there. But I feel like anyone who reads the book will come away loving the character because mm. she is just so vibrant. She's so vibrant. And there's a point where she um, she's changing because, you know, she she goes on with like uh, along with a face that doesn't even have a nose at a point. And then she gets boobs and she's like, what am I supposed to do with them? <laughs> Why? What? I can't even run properly now because I have. <laughs> so. So it's like being, it's like um, express puberty. She grows in two mm. weeks what most <laughs> people mm. do in like 10 years. It was a lot of fun to write and there's a lot of magic. There's a lot of angst. There's a little tiny bit of romance because, you know, how can you expect a girl to, um, you know, fall in love when she doesn't even know what shape her face is, right? Mm. <laughs> but I hope people read it and love it. I can't wait to read it. You know, you did mention just before you are the co-editor of a young adult uh, anthology called Writing in Colour that is uh, going to come out soon. Uh, and There we go, fam. In August, we are going to put that on blast on Bookstagram. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have work in that anthology or are you just one so of the I editors? Have, I have a... I have a and it is note on there. Mm. My main okay, so you know, every time as I said, I've said frequently before, mm. I haven't I haven't seen anyone like me being an author. And that was one of the biggest obstructions or obstacles I faced because I didn't know if I could go out and do this because nobody else had done it before. And then when I actually became an author, I realized that there are many authors out there. It's just that we don't know about them. Mm. And I know that there are many aspiring um uh writers of color out there writers writers who have who, who from marginalized fa fa marginalized mm. uh, populations who have who dream of writing who dream of holding their books and i actually thought that this book already existed because the um there's this uh um non-fiction book mm. by Ma matthew salasis mm. and it talks about how writers writing in color is way different from mm. um if you're a white writer, how we perceive stories is way different because First Nations, when you look at their stories, they start from the end and then begin the entire, right? right? And then even in the Japanese, the Asian uh, stories have a different shape compared to mm. um, the North American stories. So I was thinking, why don't I gather a group of writers who are writers of color and get them to tell their stories? as you know so that it will comfort and inspire those uh, authors who are still struggling and oh my goodness rosa the the story the, the essays that have i was just weeping when i was reading mm -hmm. there's this one essay which talks about a perseverance by darcy darcy ba little badger and she talks about how her father let her hold on and then there's another one by laura paul who talks about writing in a language that is not considered yours and mm -hmm. for for an audience that is not your own, that not directly your own, and all of these are just—they're so stunning and they're so profound. So I, so I hope whoever reads it, and I know that whoever reads it will, you know, will feel better about themselves. Will know that they're not alone. How to deal with jealousy? How to deal with, uh, you know, imposter syndrome? You're not alone on this journey. Even though you might be writing alone, there are other people right in their own rooms writing right around you. So I'm mm. excited. If you can't tell. <laughs> so yeah. Sorry, if let me, man. I'm man. I I can't. I look forward to when it it comes out. August 2023. Everyone, if you're listening, if you're watching, uh, check our Instagram bios. I'll be putting that on blast out there. Super important uh, to support, to uplift, to get this kind of work, to get these stories, to get you know our stories to get stories of marginalized folks mm -hmm. out there voice you know we need to amplify these voices uh because if we are not telling the stories then who is yeah. probably people who think 
they know our stories, but they don't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's my PSA. So <laughs> it's an important one. It's an important so, one. Mm. Yeah. You you say I want to write a book. This was a, an extension of something I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. And part of this, you say I want to write a book that is a friend, a home for someone who might not be welcomed elsewhere. And again, this is tying it right back into you know like having our voices heard, Nafisa having her voice heard, Nafisa telling her stories and and amplifying those voices. Do you think you've achieved this? Do you think that you are writing these books and that you are that friend, you are providing that home for someone who perhaps is disconnected and really just trying to find their place in this Mm -hmm. big, massive Mm -hmm. world that we live in? I feel like if you want to be welcomed somewhere, I would suggest you read um, The Candle and the Flame because the city, the city of Noor in that book is peopled by refugees. So mm. I made it explicit. And that that book was written as an escape because I wrote it when Trump got elected for the first time. Mm. I remember the feeling that the world was such a crazy place and I wanted up somewhere else to be. And I wrote that and I wrote that as a welcome place for everyone regardless of their agenda their sexual orientation their religion and so that was one part and then when i wrote um the wild ones that was to for all the for all the women and girls who have wounds in their hearts wounds that will not necessarily ever fade but the wounds that need to be expressed that book is an angry book it's 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 a call to use anger as a way to fuel your every days because sometimes you need more than just hope to go on. You need anger. And then Road of the Lost is um is more of a fairy tale. It's it's it, well not more of a fairy, it is a fairy tale. <laughs> it's about um being young again, being passionate again, living as fiercely as you can despite the fact, the fact that tomorrow might not be in be might be in existence so i feel Mm. like i have and with every book i write in the future or i'm working on i do want i I do not ever want to hurt anyone with my words so Mm. i'm very careful i even figure out the subtext of what i'm because i will just be being a literature student i just sit down and see like what am i actually saying am i do i mean what i'm saying and i know that it's very subjective and sometimes people will take what i'm saying in a way that i don't intend them to but mm. I have done my walk, and if I've done my homework, I feel like I can create a pl- a space, a safe space for all the um, readers I'm offering the books to. Mm. Uh, what does literary success uh, look like to me? To you? Yeah. So I'm still working on project projects, but I don't have any books sold right now. And I was wondering, am I ever going to sell another book again? Because I have like. I've realized that sometimes you don't get the marketing you want. Sometimes your voice isn't loud enough. And sometimes the things you write make people uncomfortable, especially the wild ones. It's not an easy mm. book to write for people or read rather. And I've, and I've had complaints that, you know, it's too bleak and whatnot. But I feel like if I am sincere with my work, somebody is going to read it and somebody is going to empathize and somebody is going to want to champion me. And so literary success, I am not comfortable with, you know, having thousands of, you know, followers and whatnot. I mean, I, I am the kind of person who would not rather, I, I would like to write my book and then just disappear. Mm. <laughs> because, um, oh, what's the name of that author? Frente, uh, Elena Ferrante, mm. who used to be, I don't know if you know her, but she used to be, I think she still is anonymous and she is huge like with the books she's very successful but there was something she said that really resonated with me and she said it's my book that's on sale so i don't know why i should be on the shelf as well that's a thing we deal with a lot because Mm. we are supposed to commodify ourselves and make our our author personalities uh, um a a commercial product as well and Mm. I, i would like a time when um, my prose was evaluated for its own rather than for the amount of or the number of followers I attracted on Instagram or social media. It just feels Mm. like if I'm not 
actively promoting my own work, I won't be successful. But mm. then you have to wonder what does success mean, mean, right? So if I can, mm. if I can touch one reader or two readers, mm. that's success to me, but not to my publisher. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole nother chapter. That's for the next time you come on the podcast, right? <laughs> I mean, that's a question that yeah. you have to ask the publisher, you know, like, mm. Because yeah, it's interesting yeah. that you say that because that's how I look at it with the podcast. Like, I'm an introvert, like through and through, and I never thought that I would be doing a podcast. But a lot of this has been um, just, you know, someone will see it and then they tell some all word of mouth. Like I, I'm not the best at promoting um, and, and things like that. I try my best, and you know, I don't, um, you know, like you know, I have followers and everything and numbers don't mean anything to me. Yeah. What's more important is that when I ask, you know, someone of, would you like to come and share a bit of your journey on the podcast? It's because I want to, I want to highlight their work, their mm. art, their craft, their music, mm. their writing. Like I want, you know, I look, at, I've, you know, I usually pretty much everyone that comes on, I've been following their work for a while. And, and I want to highlight that through my platform, because I mm -hmm. feel that these are stories that not everyone gets to hear. It's usually, you know, the more well-known podcasts, the more well-known mm -hmm. folks, but you know, if, if I'm following someone and I'm seeing what they're doing and it, if it inspires me, even just one bit and their story resonates with me, I want to share that through the podcast. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it is, you know, everyone can do a, anyone can do a podcast, but that's kind of my thing is like, you know, it's just an opportunity for me to fangirl, mm -hmm. but also just share uh, the hard work that's mm -hmm. going on with all the different guests and how they're impacting the communities. Uh, and the people that they're surrounding, they're surrounded by, you know, so mm. for example, I have you on here today, I've been following you for a while, and just seeing what you're doing, not just as an author, but as a bookstagrammer, as someone who loves to read, mm. and I'm mm. like, man, I want to highlight that, these are voices that are not necessarily heard, mm -hmm. well, in terms of the people that follow my accounts and stuff, so I want them to, to know, hey, look, mm -hmm. get onto this here, you got you've never had an affiza way you know what you're missing out go and go and check out your books so that's you know what you say sorry i say all that to say that what you shared it, it resonates yeah. Yeah. um so much with me mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> advice for aspiring writers mm -hmm. well i mean what what would you say to them I think the most important thing is to know that your story matters and nobody gets to tell you that you can't tell it. Mm. Just, you know that and be confident in that and everything mm. else will fall. Like, I mean, I used to tell people to write every day and I feel like I still will tell people, you don't need to write a book every day, but if you have a journal, write down two or three sentences, you know, just to get, to get like a car moving, you need to oil it, right? So this mm. is, this is got to get your um, writing brain go worrying you mm -hmm. deal with words another thing read the, the way i became an author i didn't learn how to write through um going to school i learned how to write by reading you read a lot mm -hmm. and don't just read what you are like read what you don't like you know once you start reading you start learning sentence structure composition and you know for the longest time i used to think i can't write because i don't know what everything is called <laughs> You know, what's a, it's a ditch, it's a dyke. What's the difference between a ditch and dyke? Especially if you are like me and you are coming to the language, uh, English as a second language. Mm. But don't ever think that coming to English, if that's the language you want to write it, is a bad thing. Because right. being writing, uh, if English is your second language, you'll be seeing it in a way that is very, very different from the way native speakers see it. And the mm. way you um, make sentences, the, the way you make um the way you um, join words together, that will be very different. That will be very innovative. So mm. don't ever let that, you know, put you down or make you less confident or discourage you. Mm. Yeah. I hope everyone heard that loud and clear. <laughs> yeah. That's what's up. <laughs> um, who, who's an author that you've always wanted to meet? Like someone that you, that inspires you in your work? 
I mean, past I actually present. met Jimmy Willow Wilson. Mm. So I met her. Um, I I, re I read um, what do you call it? I'll Lift the Unseen by her, and I was mm. so impressed by the fact that she put in a uh, hijabi woman. Mm. So I met her, and I met um, Kate Elliott. Who are you familiar with? Kate Elliott. She mm -hmm. lives. She lives in Hawaii, and she writes this really wonderful fantasy fiction. Um, I met her. Well, I was lucky. <laughs> Being an author means you're lucky in that you get to meet uh, these other authors. Mm. And the, the other author I would love to meet, but probably won't ever because she's gone, is uh, mm. Diana Wynne Jones. Oh. She was she was great. I read her book, and there's so much life in there. Mm. I am. It's weird because even though I'm a writer. I'm the kind of person who likes the books but does mm. not care too much for like I don't go out of my way to find out all that sounds horrible mm. but like, I will look at the books and then if you ask me who wrote it I'd be like mm, someone wrote it but yeah. they wrote well but let me figure find out who so that's why <laughs> I was so impressed that you that you messaged me I was like oh <laughs> but yeah well I, I was just grateful that you said yes I was like there's no way because I just quickly on that I was like do I have to contact you know some authors you have to contact like the yeah. agent and I'm That's always because... kind of like freaking out like I probably have to con go through official business kind yeah. of thing so I kind of test the waters and if someone says oh could you contact then I'll do that mm. but you know I was like I don't know if Nafisa is gonna like reply back <laughs> I think I only do that when um, it's a blur. I haven't asked for a blurb because that requires mm. a lot more of my um, time than. So I have to really plan if I'm, somebody's going to ask me for a blurb. Mm. I have the time, so I will ask them to contact me via my um, mm. my agent. But otherwise, I deal with. I'm not that big, so it's. You like, are stop. You cut it out. Cut it out. Stop I it like right now. This. I like interacting with you know. Uh, people like you who are so um you know enthusiastic about books so it's it's great yeah. to talk to someone who actually liked my book <laughs> you are amazing but you know i think people want to know this because outside of writing i read that you're an embroiderer but but i want to talk about k-dramas because oh, okay. it says that you enjoy k-dramas and i was just like i wonder if i can ask this question well you know what i'm gonna ask this question k-dramas talk okay. to me <laughs> i used to watch them a lot more than i do right yeah. now I don't know if you know, but I speak Korean. Oh, I no, I didn't know. know you speak Korean. Like how? <laughs> how? Come on, Nafisa, you, you're you're just okay. Adding more to your bio here. Okay, tell us how it is that you come to speak uh, Korean. Okay, this this is probably the reason I read. Uh, I actually learned English very seriously when I was in um, grade one, is mm. because I wanted to read um, webtoons, Korean webtoons. Ah. It annoyed me because there were no um, translations, and I was like, okay, I have to learn the language. Oh, <laughs> so, you're amazing! I know, but then now I still wait for the translations because you know, just I'm not that I'm not fluent, and then, and then if I right. read. Korean, I have to, you know, look at a dictionary. Mm. Oh, nobody's got time for that. So, but um, watching K dramas, those are great. They, they actually like. I don't know. Do you watch them? Yeah, I, I do. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm asking you this question. I was it's like, amazing. I'm gonna ask Nafisa and give us some recommendations. The storytelling <laughs> is so amazing. Mm. Like, I love the fact that they used to be able to wrap everything up in like one season, like 16 mm. episodes, and you're, you're done. I mean, right. if you like, have you seen Master's Son? No. Okay, that is, it's, it's, um, it have a struggles the fence between being scary and being funny. So mm. it's a romantic, scary comedy. Okay. <laughs> like you have <laughs> you have ghosts and then you're like giggling to you and you're like, hmm, I don't know. But it's so well done. Like it's about this woman who sees ghosts and then she meets the CEO of this mall or something. And then mm. as soon as she touches him, the ghosts go away. And she's like, Oh my god. So she's trying to make up <laughs> reasons to touch him. And he's like, What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> and obviously there's, there's romance and there's like mm. host cliche shenanigans. Mm. It's, it's really fun. And um goblin. Not no. Oh, I know what you're talking about, but I haven't watched it. But it's I always see it on TikTok. Hey, like everyone's like got snippets of that that yeah, goblin. Yeah. But the thing is with that one is I was actually standing <laughs> the two, the couple I was standing was not the oh. guy, the main lead and the female oh, lead. I, I was see, standing I the Grim Reaper and the Goblin. Oh, okay, okay. Because they 
they fit so well together. Yeah. Like, Why would you even like the girl is so much younger than you? She, she's fabulous. I love her. <laughs> but the chemistry wasn't there. You yeah. were, look at the Grim Reaper. They were from the same age, you know. You <laughs> <at> a mentally. <laughs> <laughs> this belong you. I mean, he, that boy, that man is so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this was gonna bring out another side of you. Oh yeah, he's beautiful. When he smiles, I'm like, oh. <laughs> I haven't watched any. Oh no, no, no. I was. <laughs> I've watched um, walk later, drink now, or is it drink now, walk later? It's about you would like that one. It's okay. about these three women who are like friends, like very close friends. And then they're also in in love with drinking. So it's about <laughs> their lives. And it's very, um, they pursue realistic. So th their conversations are very much um, colloquial. There's a lot of swearing there too, but it's, all, it's like it's Korean. So we don't even know that's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> But um, it's, it's funny. It's heartbreaking. <laughs> but I love the fact that they're such close friends because usually mm. you don't get female friendship all that much in um, K dramas or any dramas, actually, to be honest. Mm. So I love that. What else have I watched? I've actually been watch been uh, watching a Chinese drama. It's uh, about this um, lawyer who made up a husband because uh, <laughs> the office that she walked in, walks in, mm. they they um they have this rule that if you are single, you don't go get anywhere. So uh. she's like, okay, I'll have a husband, and she she downloads a photo of a random person from the internet and puts it on her desk. And she's like, this is my husband. And then guess what? The husband shows up, and she's like. <laughs> <laughs> it's a strange guy who well, thinks is her husband and has been for two years yeah you acted out with her and he's like no i want a divorce <laughs> <laughs> it's called, um, her perfect husband and her yeah, yeah. it's amusing it's entertaining i don't have to think about it <laughs> Oh, you're funny. Um, yeah. So, and yeah, yeah. K dramas. That's something when you have time. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> how do you look after yourself? Um, we're talking. You know, I ask this to all the guests because they're super busy people. Uh, how do you take care of yourself um, mentally? You know, food, health, that kind of thing. Okay. So, um, I was in a really bad place in November, and then I decided mm. that to be kinder to myself i need to stay uh like just take a step back from social media mm. because social media is just like you tend to compare yourself to everyone else and then you're like oh that person is way uh, you know way more successful than you they have way more fans whatnot and then you tend to even though you have achieved a lot mm. tend to you know um push, push yourself down and you you people are mean to themselves and i was mm. mean to myself and then i was like no i i'm not going to do that so um i took a step back from social media and then um i also <laughs> decided that i needed to sleep on time like i was a night owl i was like no i need to sleep at like midnight because that's i prefer to uh, sleep late in the morning like till four or five. i can easily but no i made myself do that and that had a huge effect on my um mentally because you know i guess it makes made me feel better because mm. i realized that i was happier when i was my my routine changed and um i made a rule to not be mean to myself if i caught myself you know calling myself you know you're worthless i would just be like i'm finding you a dollar because how dare you talk to yourself like that mm. <laughs> So I, I feel like you have to realize that you are your own best friend. And if you can't love yourself, you can't expect anyone else to love you. So those were important things for me to learn. I love that. Mm -hmm. Super, super, super important lessons. Book recommendations. Uh, uh, do you, Anything you want to plug? Anything that you've been reading lately that you're like, hey, everyone, here's something that I think you should read um i'm reading this it's called if you could see the sun it's about this girl who who uh, is going to school in beijing which is full of um very rich people and then <laughs> she starts to disappear she's a um and she makes she's like you know i have i am invisible and now i can do things certain things i'm still figuring out what things she's going to be done but i feel like she's going to you know go off on her criminal life just like <laughs> <laughs> it resonates with you huh you're like hey this could have been me in another life <laughs> one, i don't know if you can see this it's called the penguin book of the prose poem 
from Baudelaire mm-hmm. and Carson. And it is really fascinating. It's what I like about it is that it has um um book it has translated works, a lot of translated works in here. And this one is by an Indonesian author. It's called Apple and Knife. And it's by Intan Paramadita. And these are um, short stories about um, myths. Uh, it's retellings of myths and fairy tales. And there's some horror fiction. And it explores the dangers and power of occupying a female body in today's world. So it's very much up my alley. And finally, I started this. It's called Tongue Breaker. Poems and uh, performance texts by Leah Lakshmi Piepsna Sam- Samar- Samarasina. Mm. And it's all about... Um, uh, it's about a queer woman, um, a femme, and it's a poetry and performance text, and it's amazing. Okay, we are going to put that on blast. Thank <laughs> you for your book recommendations. You mentioned earlier, August 2023, we can expect the anthology that you are co-editor for. <laughs> Anything else that we can look out for? Yes, this year? I have a story in an anthology called Magic Has No Borders. Mm. And it's a, it's a story about a grandma and her granddaughters set in Fiji. And it's a lovely story. And there's food. There's, I love writing about food. <laughs> it was like, yes, you got me right there with the food. <laughs> yes. So it, it's all about the food and, uh, you know, family. So Magic mm. Has No Borders, which is out on May 23rd. Awesome. May 23rd, I will put that on blast. Oh, Nafisa, man, I have, oh my goodness, what what an episode, what an episode. I I appreciate you coming into the space, you know, as we begin to wrap up, I just want to say a huge, massive thank you for the Talanoa, for sharing, you know, parts of your journey, um, such an honor to have you on the show. Uh, wishing you all the best with the different releases happening this year. Um, take care of yourself. And yeah, I, I, I will now give you the opportunity just to wrap up the podcast <laughs> with some final words. Thank you so much, Rosa, for um, reaching out to me. It was, a, it was a pleasure being here talking about books and talking about writing. And anyone who's listening, if you want to read about, you know, stories that will make you think, that make you, will make you feel, please give The Wild Ones, The Kennel in the Flame, and The Road of the Lost a chance. I'm, I promise you'll like them. But if you don't like them, you can message me. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you give a lot of love to Rosa, who's doing wonderful work. And it was an honor being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs>